Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's Eastist Improvement webinar series. It's been a series of these, um, a few of these different webinars run by the team, um, and they're all available on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to um, spend any time going over those, please feel free to have a look on our YouTube channel. So today, Paul and I are going to be talking to you for about uh, 40 to 45 minutes on data for improvement. We've got a series of slides. What I would say is these will always be coming out to you. Um, so feel free to share. Um, there's nothing on there which is kind of um, particularly protected or anything like that or very sensitive data. So please feel free to share with these anybody that you would feel would benefit from them. So just um, a, a little welcome to from Paul and myself. Um, so we are the loosest form of a team that you could possibly get. There's only two of us. Um, granted, we're in the much larger uh, elective and emergency care improvement support team. Um, uh, I've been in this role now for about seven years. Paul is a, a relative uh, newbie to the team, but has been in the NHS for around about 10 years. We've got about 30 years experience in the NHS um, in multiple different analytical um, elements across the, the UEC pathway and elective care. Um, and what we're going to be talking to you today are a series of different things. We're going to be looking at the role of data for improvement and I'm, I'm conscious that a lot of people kind of interchange the words data, information, things like that. Um, I'm going to predominantly use the word data um, today for various different reasons. The one thing is I'll, I try and like to keep a consistent message. So we're going to be looking at the role of data for improvement and how that can be used for your improvement journey. I'm also going to be looking at the role of an analyst. And what I want to try and do from that is draw out the fact that people can't work in silos. So we're going to be looking at how the role of a, a, a traditional analyst and how that needs to move with the modern NHS. Then Paul's going to be talking about um, what on earth is SPC. So for those people who are, are not familiar, that acronym stands for Statistical Process Control. And Paul's going to do a great job on explaining what that is and how that can be used for your improvement journey. And then also importantly, we're then going to look at, well, where do we go from here? Because data is just a number, you know, it really is a what, what is happening. But actually what we need to then do is we need to move it on to so what, what does it actually mean? And then more importantly, the now what? So if we know a piece of data, where are we going to transform it into and what are we going to do off the back of that? So first off, do you know the basics? Now, as I said, data is just a number. It, it literally means nothing by itself. It always needs a bit of interpretation. And when I used to work in a hospital, we had a bit of a, a mantra, which was data into action, actually moving it away from just a number and putting it into the hands of people that can actually make a change. But really what you need to do is understand the basics. Now, a thing I used to do, a bit of a challenge I used to do with our, the consultants that I worked with, was I would regularly challenge them about, do they know the simple numbers coming in and out of our hospital? How many attendances, how many admissions, discharges, long stay patients, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, we, and we'd have kind of, regular quizzes around this. I'm a big uh, pub quizzer for my sins. Um, I'm not particularly great, but I do, do enjoy doing them. But one of the things I was found really fascinating was the magnificent variation in the answers that I got from consultants in the hospital. And most people kind of broadly got admissions right, attendances right, things like that. But one of the, the, the simpler numbers, which I thought people might understand, was around how many patients die in hospital every day. And the variation was absolutely unbelievable. So we kind of make the assumption that everybody knows some of the more simpler numbers that happen in the NHS. And actually that assumption is really, really wrong. So actually when we're starting off anything around data, you need to build up from the perception that people don't know anything. And we need to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we need to know the data and Trust me, the one thing that NHS has got an awful lot of is data. But it's, as I said earlier, it's about how we transform that into doing something more meaningful and putting it into the hands of people that can actually make the change. Knowing the data, knowing the source of it, there are so many different data tables. And 
for a non-analytical or non-informatic person, you don't necessarily need to understand the data. You don't necessarily need to know the source, but you need to work with people who do. And that's where this kind of triangulation comes in about knowing the people. So we've kind of got this, this trinity, this group of analysts, operational and clinical people. And if they start to work together, they will understand the task so that they can then formulate the question and work out how they're going to transform this data set of just rows and columns and columns of dozens upon dozens of tables and put it into a meaningful way that people can understand. You know, the thing that one of the things that frustrates me is when I see on on Twitter mainly is about when when people who, you know, many of them I know, and they talk about, well, data can do this and data can do that. Well, quite honestly, data can't do anything by itself. It needs to be put into the hands of people can, that can actually make this change. So us as analysts, we don't necessarily make that change. We can't go on a ward and kind of inform people about X, Y and Z and, you know, discharge journeys and so on and so forth. But we can analyze some of the data that is being tran translated and put into systems getting it into something which is more usable and putting it into the hands of people that can make the change. And as Einstein once said, he said everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. You know, the NHS is phenomenally complex, but actually some of the questions that we get asked are relatively simple. And we're going to be starting to have a look at some of the questions that are of the more basic nature and how we can then start off with that and translate it into more complex data patterns. So when we're understanding about the basics, we need to think about two main questions. What are the drivers to the challenge that we face and what are the problems you are trying to solve? You really need to think about the objectives of what it is that you're trying to focus on, because if you get asked a relatively ambiguous question, the, the solution might come to you in a relatively ambiguous way. But the good news is, is that I have spent hours and hours and hours upon mapping the urgent emergency care pathway for you. Um, and it, it's, it's taken me a long time. Um, and I think particularly over the, part of the past few months, since we're kind of coming to hopefully towards the back end of the pandemic, is that I've just been more aware of the phenomenal different pathways for, across the urgent emergency care system. And it's, you know, whereas if you went back 20 or 30 years, it would literally just be patients coming to the A&E department and then they go somewhere after that. But now there are so many different entry points into the system just from an urgent, urgent, urgent emergency care perspective, let alone looking at elective care uh, and cancer care and maternity. But just from an urgent care. But the good news is that I've mapped this uh, process for you. And I think we really should be um, taking on this on board. And I, I think I'll pitch it forward to some of the more senior people in, in NHS England, because uh, it's a very accurate description of how patients actually do enter the urgent emergency care environment. So what we've then got is we've got different ways in which we can collect data. And what I just want to talk about is the role of an analyst. So our, I've yeah, I've got about 19 years experience in the NHS working for various different organisations. And the thing that I've found in, in whether that's working in primary care, acute care, also done work in community and social care as well, is that there is sometimes this gap between the, the data and the people that can make the improvements. So what we've got is we've got my, people like myself, I would call myself an, an analyst of sorts. I definitely wouldn't call myself a traditional analyst, but I'm over here on the left hand side. I'm the type of person that has got access to all the data. I've got a lot of theory around all the modeling and all the data, um, you know, terminology that has been used in the past. I've got access to a lot of different tools um, and I've got access to all the techniques that I've been taught over a number of years. But the main word in that is theory. I've got a lot of theory. I can I can talk about the data. I can say that stuff's going up. I can say that stuff's going down. But actually, what I want to be able to do, so I want to be able to translate this and put it in the hands of the people over on the right hand side. And these people are the people with operational and clinical experience. They've got the anecdote because they're living it, breathing it every single day. And particularly, you know, been conscious over the past kind of couple of years is that, you know, uh, data and analytics has definitely been considered to be a back office function. 
Um, and, you know, part of me thinks that that is absolutely fine. However, there's been an awful lot of Uh, there's been a lot of evidence that has been needed to kind of say, well, where are we in terms of our COVID patients? Where are we in terms of our elective recovery? But we need that triangulation because analysts can't do it by themselves because they have got the theory. They've got the tools, but they've also got the evidence. They're putting it in the hands of the people that then triangulate it with the operational clinical experience. That's where we move data from just being a number and putting it into a little bit of information. So that might be just a relatively simple graph. And we're going to be talking about visualization in a few minutes time, but then putting it into intelligence. So the graph will say, well, stuff's going up, stuff's going down. But the intelligence will be, well, why is it going up? Why is it going down? Why is there significant variation? And then about the action. So what are we actually going to do about it? So a number's gone up. We can put it in a graph to say how it's statistically changed over a period of time. We can then put some intelligence because we know that it's gone up because of X, Y, Z. And actually the action would then be we need to address this problem and how are we going to do it? So once again, that movement from data into action is pivotal. But as long as you've got that triumvirate between the informatic analyst person and the operational and clinical colleagues across the NHS. So the measurement for Im improvement journey has a seven step process. It can broadly be broken up into two particular areas. So we've kind of got um, stages one, two and three, which are, are kind of pre-improvement. And then we've got steps four, five, six and seven, which then have a look at how we're going to actually analyze the data, present and visualize. And we're going to be looking at this in, in two different ways. So when it comes to actually having a look about your, your aim and choosing your measures, you really need to think about your objective. What is it that you are actually trying to achieve through this improvement journey? And um, uh, when I once again, when I used to work at a trust, I regularly got asked questions around um, relatively ambiguous questions. So I think demand is increasing. And I, I vividly remember one of the sessions where we started to have a look at um, just demand. You know, and the question I did actually get asked was, I think demand is increasing. But the problem is, is that if you have such an ambiguous question, you are going to get an ambiguous response. And one of the things I remember from my degree days, which isn't uh, which is a, quite a long time ago. So and unsurprisingly, I don't remember a great deal from that. But is the uh, the shotgun versus rifle approach as it was to do with marketing. But you, you can apply it to an awful lot of uh, situations. And the shotgun versus rifle analogy is that, you know, if I fire a shotgun with all the different pellets in it, I might hit a target of, you know, from 10 metres away, but I might not do. Some of the pellets might hit it, some might not. But if I use the rifle, I can target in on the exact thing that I am trying to, for the, for the target perspective, trying to hit. But also from our objectives, what is it that we are specifically trying to do? And what it was, was I was working with the coup and she was saying, well, we think demand is increasing. But, you know, if you start just having a look at the basics, that's OK. But you need to then delve down into the next level. So we started to have a look at, well, OK, well, maybe it's just overall demand into our emergency departments. OK, that's fair enough. But actually, we, we ruled it out relatively quickly. And then you start to have a look at, well, OK, well, maybe it's is it a difference between the ambulance patients and the walking patients? OK, maybe it is. But the, the, but the main thing is, is this is where you need to work with your analysts because the data is in abundance. So actually using a more exam question approach to looking at your measurement for improvement will help you achieve the desired outcome in terms of the data that you will need for that. Now, there's loads and loads of different improvement tools around this. Driver diagrams are absolutely fantastic with you uh, for, for use in this. If you don't have any access to any driver diagrams, we as an ESIS team have uh, have, have got training in that and more than happy to help you out with that. But there's also, uh, if you just type into Google about driver diagrams, um, I know it's a very hot topic in the NHS over the past few years, so there'll be ample opportunity for you to have a look at that. And the last thing is to actually have a look about, is it measurable? So I know that I said that the NHS is awash with data and it really is, but there may be, such a specific improvement thing that you are trying to pick up that, that it will not be measurable. And that the challenge around that is then 
how do you prove that there has been an improvement? Now, it's not always going to be through a number because it might be one of your improvement things might be around, um, you know, the attitude, behaviours, the, the cultural things, the softer side of data. Now, there might be things that you can have a look at in terms of the NHS staff survey, which is uh, published on an annual basis. But you need to understand and work with the information people to understand about is your aim measurable or not? And if it's not, that's not necessarily a problem. You just need to mention it in some of your assumptions. Some of the documents that we've got and we'll be talking through later on, they do come from multiple different sources. So what we try and do through these tools is we try and already give you answers to a lot of the questions that have been posed to myself and Paul over the past few years. And what we've done is we've worked directly with organisations to improve these improvement tools so that people can have access to these wherever and whenever they want to. What we then need to be able to do is we need to uh, understand the data. Now, one of the really, really key things in this is that everybody has their own way in which to represent, present and visualise data. Now, my old chief exec, he was from a finance ba background. I know that uh, quite a few chief executives are. That's not necessarily a problem, but he really didn't like anything that was visual or graphical. He preferred data tables. Now, there are pros and cons to that for sure. Uh, and I've seen over the past couple of days, actually, some some data tables that I probably would not necessarily advise going down the route of. But what you need to do is you need to understand that everybody has their own way in which they like to look at data. And that's really, really important to understand. So once you've gone through that kind of looking at the aims of your improvement journey, what the data is that you're trying to have a look at, but then understanding different ways in which it's presented, because people want to understand the evidence that is being put out there. Understanding the goals of the end user. So once again, looking at the objective and working with as a group the um, the different types of data you've got. You know, I, I cannot stress it enough. I know I said about the back office function of the informatics team, but the, the, the experience that I got when I worked at a trust was actually working directly with the operational and clinical people. So I would re I would regularly go out to meetings with people. I would shadow different people across the organisation so that I understood exactly what it is. And then work out how to distribute these particular tools. So Excel, it has its advantages. Now everyone has access to it. Obviously, it's been in the press over the past few months with what's happening over the COVID and, and mis misusing Excel. There's loads of different types of business intelligence software kits that most people will probably have in their organisations, such as Tableau or Click or Power BI. Um, but there are loads of different methods for distributing this data and working out how people want to receive it. They might want to receive it via their email. They might want to receive it on a mobile device. So actually having that ability that we now have just enables people to have a look at it wherever and whenever they want to. So here's just a few examples of looking at uh, different ways in which to visualise the data. So th this is a classic example of one of those magic eyes. If you remember going back a few fair few years now, where if you looked at something long enough, you could see a dinosaur. You know, the, the challenge you've got around looking at a data table such as this is trying to spot trends is very, very difficult. OK, so as I said, some people do like to receive it in a data table, but you would certainly want some way in which to visualise that a number is significantly out of line with recent performance or in terms of national performance, regional performance, et cetera, et cetera. So data tables aren't necessarily wrong. However, there are also other ways in which you should not present data. This is arguably one of the, uh, the, yeah, the, the most troubling graph, I should say, that we've, uh, we've seen over the past few years. Um, and, uh, you know, how somebody is supposed to interpret this graph is anybody's guess. However, what I would stress is that even though something might not be particularly visual to look at, you can always turn it into something nice. OK, so working with different people, understanding how people look at different pieces of data and then looking at the visualisation is absolutely key if we want to understand the improvement journey and put the evidence along with the anecdote. And finally, the last type of graph that I want to kind of draw your attention to is a pie chart. Now. The problem with pie charts are absolutely numerous. 
However, there is only one good way in which to use a pie chart, and that is to demonstrate the amount of pie that has been eaten and the amount of pie that hasn't been eaten. That is the only good use of a pie chart. Please don't use them and please don't use exploding pie charts or things like 3D exploding pie charts, which we have seen. In some very, very few instances, they do have their uh, use. However, the vast majority of time, they do not provide a, a accurate level of data to go into for a particular improvement journey. So I'm just now going to hand you over to uh, Paul in my team, who's now going to be talking about statistical process control. Lovely, thank you. And Chris, I've asked for control, so hopefully you'll yep. see my mouse moving around because I'll be doing a lot of demonstrations. So yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Paul Villard. Um, yeah, part of Chris's uh, huge team of two. Um, but uh, as uh, very similar to Chris, I've worked in an acute trust previously, and then I've done a couple of years in the uh, National Demand and Capacity Programme, and I've now joined Chris as uh, an improvement advisor uh, in informatics. So um, I'm going to have the, the, the fun job, perhaps, if you're interested in this sort of thing, of actually taking you through a really practical kind of way of encapsulating all of that stuff that Chris just talked about um, and demonstrating how we can use data for improvement and how we can use the statistical process control chart as a tool to um, to both kind of identify needs for improvement, but also identify where improvements have been made as well. Hopefully I'm going to click and it's going to work. I've gone too far. OK, so um, to start us off as a kind of a starter for 10, uh, a little plug for the ESIS UEC dashboard uh, distributed out to um, about 3000 people on a twice weekly basis, not daily basis. Um, using the ED SITREP data. It's a really good little tool just to give you an overview of a whole range of urgent and emergency care metrics. Um, and why we wanted to show you this is, this is again, thinking about different ways of visualizing. This is a really interesting way, or a, 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 it's, it's one particular way of showing data um, to people that are perhaps more kind of numbers inclined. So just a really quick kind of example, you know, we're looking at four hour performance for this week and then looking at what it was at a six week average and seeing, you know, OK, are we doing better this week than we have done in the last six weeks or or not? But the really interesting thing that we do with this is that we actually apply some of um, the statistical process control chart rules to this data. So we can see here at the bottom of this little box here, you can see rule one, rule two, rule three and rule four. I won't go into detail of what they are actually, um, what they actually entail. But essentially what we're looking at here is our, is, is our data showing us that something statistically significant is happening. And that's statistically significant, not in terms of kind of context around, we know that it's Christmas or, or something like that, but actually is something happening in the data that we're not expecting statistically to happen. And that's what an SPC chart is really, really useful for identifying and showing. Click. Okay, so we, what on earth is, is SPC? As Chris was saying, it's a way to move those, those kind of initial blocks from data so just raw numbers into some sort of intelligence. Now, what an SBC chart shows you is the variation of a particular uh, measure over time. And what we can do is we can look at and see if that variation is kind of normal or expected process variation because no one day is going to be the same or is something statistically unlikely happening. And it can also help us um, to really kind of identify improvements, but also where perhaps we're having some sort of concern that we need to, um, to look at. So that this is an example of an SBC chart. And again, this is taken from the UEC dashboard. I can see some comments coming in saying that they want, they want access to it. We'll sort that out for you, not a problem. But this is just one, one, you know, kind of one iteration of an SPC chart. Um, there's lots of kind of tools out there that you can use. This is just the particular one that we use. And the way that this is configured is when we have something statistically unlikely happening that is 
in a kind of moving in the right direction. So in this case, low attendances, we can see that they're marked with these blue dots. So we've got some sort of special cause, so some sort of special variation, something we don't expect to be happening, but that's a good thing. So we would rather have the, the fewer attendances marked as blue. And then actually when we start to get these larger peaks outside of what we're expecting to happen, we, get, we can see some of those special cause concerns. So something that we need to, to investigate, or we need to look at, or we need to kind of consider what, what needs to happen here. Now, there's, there's kind of, so you got this SBC chart, but actually the way that it really clicked for me to understand what an SBC chart is doing is to think of it as a normal distribution turned on its side. Now, hope, hopefully lots of people are kind of aware of this kind of this bell curve shape. So the closer you are to your, your average, you expect more of your, uh, your samples or more of your data points to be within this range. And then slowly as you go out to the sides, it gets kind of fewer, you expect fewer data points in these kind of these wider ranges. And this is all an SBC chart is, it's just this turned on its side. So you have your upper control limit and your lower control limit. So if you're having data points outside of your upper control limit, actually there's a 0.13% chance that data should be out there. So it's obviously indicating that something is happening um, that's kind of moving the process along. Or, or is happening that's that's strange and we don't expect to be happening. And SBC charts are really good because um, you can look at a kind of a, a, a straight run chart. You know, you date, you you plot your 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 points over a, a period of time, and you can see all these lumps and bumps. And you kind of think, oh god, the variation on this is is crazy. You know, the, the, the data is all over the place. But actually. Statistical process control will allow you to look at this and say, OK, although it's all over the place, is this statistically unlikely to happen or is this just part of the process? Is this just what we expect the process to look like normally? So in this top chart, although the kind of like we say, we've got the spikes and we've got some of the peaks and the troughs and we've got quite a wide range of data. Actually, this is all kind of within what we would expect to be happening. So there's no kind of special cause concern. There's no nothing that we kind of say we're doing either really well or really poorly with this this particular uh, measure that we're looking at. As opposed to something like this down here for our beds occupied, again, just a snapshot from our um, from our dashboard, we can see that although the limits are tighter. And that so the, the, the variation is less in terms of the, the raw kind of numbers up and down actually the process is seeing huge different variations in terms of we have this kind of this real uh, trough down here and then these peaks and then you know and out into these next peaks you know further on down the line but what this can do this highlights the periods where okay we need to look at what was happening at this particular time in so in this example you know in kind of throughout february what were we doing that was different to what we were doing in january where we had a slightly better position. And that's what an SBC chart is really good at kind of highlighting and, and identifying where you need to go and, and have a look and see. And again, it's that moving from just this data, which this is just data, you know, at this point, there's nothing special going on here, but moving it into that kind of that more intelligence of, okay, now let's put some context around what's happening. Why is it doing this? Why is the the process looking out of control in this particular example, but not necessarily up here. And again, a little plug for our, uh, our dashboard within our dashboard. If you've completed some sort of improvement event, so uh, this this is false. This is this isn't real data, but it's just to give you an example. We had our our kind of our lower um, our low period here. If you've done something and you've started to see an improvement and you can then track that on your SBC chart, we can see that our limits, our upper and lower control limits, kind of they, they tighten and they, they decrease when that improvement was happening. And then we finish that improvement and look, we, we go back off up into a, a high peak again. So again, it's evidencing the, the work that's happening and the, the things that are happening, the things that you're doing that are working really well, this is a fantastic tool to evidence, OK, this worked. We need to think about rolling this out further or doing this more or, you know, all that sort of um, this is your kind of your evidence base of your 
change. So clearly we, we like an SPC chart, but it doesn't mean that you can do it for everything. So this is a really interesting example of the number of COVID beds occupied uh, going into last uh, last winter, I believe. And actually we can see that we've, we've plugged it into an SBC chart tool and everything is some sort of special cause variation. There's nothing in here that is kind of going, no, this is a normal point. So clearly it doesn't work for everything. You need to understand the rules, but actually just looking at this and plugging this into uh, into this tool is still really useful because it shows that you cannot, you know, that, that we weren't expecting this sort of this massive increase to happen, but actually it's still really useful to, to have this charted and plotted out. And so you can understand that actually the SBC isn't the, the, the perfect tool for this. So what, can, what what else can you do? So it's a good way of kind of eliminating the, the use of an SBC chart as well. And that's it, back over to Chris to look at other ways to look at our data. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, so what I would uh, absolutely stress from that is um, big, we are huge advocates of statistical process control. There's loads and loads and loads of documentation around that. If, if SPC is new to you, um, Sam Riley at NHS ENI have has developed some absolutely fantastic uh, documentation along with her team. We'd be happy to either connect the, the two up or um, we can send out documentation um, which details much more around what SPC is and goes into a little bit more detail of conscious that, um, that we've had to kind of gloss over this quite quickly in terms of time uh, this afternoon. But what I just want to kind of then have a look at is other ways to look at data. So, you know, SPC came from manufacturing um, and, you know, a lot of people do use SPC, but then there's a lot of people that don't for various different reasons. And I'd say the two main reasons are they either don't know about it or they don't understand it. And that, you know, both of those is, is absolutely fine. However, we do want to kind of, if we're going to go down this measurement for improvement journey, we do need to get more people looking at tried and tested techniques. I talked about earlier that the kind of the analytical teams and functions within organisations will have access to, but moving that away from just a, a computer screen and actually putting it into the hands of people. But there's other ways in which to look at data. And so what we, one thing that I've been asked more and more over the past few months is about relative performance position. And, and so understanding from a statistical process control chart is absolutely fantastic. OK, so as Paul was talking about occupied beds or four hour performance or whatever it is you want to measure, most things can be put onto an SPC chart. However, people have been saying to me, yeah, OK, so we're, you know, one thing is particularly going up or one thing is particularly going down. But what they want to understand is, are they in the same boat as everybody else? Because if everybody, if they're for our performance, and I'll just pick on that from an urgent emergency care perspective, but we could apply it to anything. If our for our performance is going down, is everybody else is going down? Because, you know, we want to do as well as we can. You know, nobody goes into NHS you know, thinking, great, you know, let's see how many patients can breach the four hour standard state, right? That does not happen. Everybody's in the NHS because they are focused around safe, high quality patient care. But we kind of want to put a bit of perspective around that. And one of the things that has happened over the, the pandemic is that, you know, the pandemic has, has caused loads and loads of uh, issues for multiple, multiple people. And the one thing that we can look at in terms of uh, demand data is that particularly, you know, when the first uh, lockdown uh, happened in, in March, 2000, last stages of March 2020 was attendances significantly decreased. But it didn't take long for it to go uh, back up to a kind of a, a pre-pandemic position or in fact, nowadays it's actually uh, surpassed that. But there's there are some organisations that have seen phenomenal uh, attendance increase. Uh, so if we look at the past quarter and compare that to the same quarter the year before, I know some people will be going, well, hang about, you're comparing a kind of a back end of the pandemic to a mid pandemic position. But as long as I compare it with everybody, then that's OK. OK, it would only be different if I kind of chopped and changed different definitions. but 
you know, one organisation that I've been working with, they've seen um, an increase in their walk-in attendances of 30%. Okay, so year on year, most recent quarter compared to the quarter before, they've seen a 30% increase in their walk-in attendances. Now, at any other time uh, throughout the, the course of the NHS, if you said you'd had a year on year increase of 30 percent, that would be phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And if that organisation just has a look at themselves, they might be thinking, oh, my word, this is phenomenal. We must be a special case. What's going on here? However, if we then put that into context of the nat national position, we can see that there's been a phenomenal variation. So what this is, same same data, it's looking at the, the growth in walk-in attendances from the most current quarter to the same quarter the year before. And you can see that the vast majority of uh, hospitals in the country have seen an increase of some description. You'll notice, I think there's four uh, sites that have seen a decrease in their walk-in attendances. But if we were that organisation that had a 30% increase, we could be thinking, this is phenomenal, oh my word, unbelievable. However, if you've been working with your primary care colleagues to try and reduce patients coming into your walk-in attendances and saw that increase of 30 percent you might kind of go well hang about this hasn't been working at all but what do, doing the data like this allows you to do is allows you to put it into context of everybody else because yes you've seen an increase but the increase has not been as great as everybody else so while work that you thought might not have been doing particularly well everybody else has seen a greater increase than us so our actually improvement has worked in effect. So it just allows you to put that into to different um, different context. And what Paul was talking about in terms of the UEC dashboard. So we do um, we do have different tools that are available. What I'm also conscious of, and I've just come from a meeting discussing the same thing, is that there are dozens, dozens, dozens of dashboards out there. OK, and they are some of them are really easily accessible. Uh, some of them are not. Some of them you need to have passwords and so on and so forth. You know, the UEC dashboard, as I said earlier, and as Paul's talked about, the UEC dashboard was um, created by me to help our program internally, but also help organisations because some organisations do not have the ability and the analytical capacity to be able to create things like this. So these tools are freely available. If anybody would like access to anything that Paul and I have talked about today, please feel free. Our, our emails are going to be at the end of this, this slide deck. Please feel free to drop us an email and we'll happily send these out to you. Because one of the tools that we've now gone on to create is called the, the SAPIT. Now that's called the Summary Acute Provider Indicator Table. Now, some of you on the call might have heard of uh, the, the, uh, another dashboard called the SEDIT, which is the Summary Emergency Department Indicator Table. And that, as it says in the name, is very ED focused. What we try to do in the SAP is we try to bring data from multiple different sources, from multiple different dashboards into one view so that you haven't got to go, you know, you, you're we're all busy people, right? You haven't got time to kind of go, I've lost my U name and password for that oh is that dashboard emailed out or is you know how do i get access to this so we wanted to create a dashboard that we could send out on a monthly basis and that would have all of this data already into it but what it would do is we'll do two things it will show your most uh, your your performance but then it will show your relative performance to the rest of the country and so you know as i talked about right at the beginning of the session you know the, the some of the more generic questions that we get asked is that have attendances gone up? Are we seeing more children? Are we seeing more ambulances? Uh, what's our four hour performance? What's our ambulance handovers? We can see that this dashboard will automatically answer those questions. So for this particular organization, they've seen their ED attendances at 44% growth from this year compared to the year before. But then we can also see that it's flagged up as red. Now red will be flagged as the most challenged. I try and refrain from the terms good and bad because they're, they're quite relative terms. I try and say most and least challenged. A red indicator will be indicating a most challenged position. And then it goes amber, light green and dark green for the least challenged or in the lowest quartile in the country. 
And what this will allow you to do is it will allow you to kind of say, OK, so that's an interesting one is that our ED attendances have grown up by 44 percent. But what it will immediately allow you to do is it Im immediately go, go down to the next why. You know, I said about the, the root cause analysis, the five whys. So we can immediately look at is it an issue with ambulance or is it an issue with our walk in attendances? And we can immediately say, well, actually, it's nothing to do with our ambulance provider. It's actually all to do with walk in attendances. So it's going to direct our conversations to maybe not necessarily with our ambulance provider, but with our CCG um, colleagues and maybe even our, our, our high level and our, our ICS. So we're already starting to look down at that root cause analysis five ways. There's loads of other metrics on here as well. One that I'll draw your attention to as well is that when we go out to organisations, if I had a pound for every time people said our patients are sicker, or our patients are older, or our patients this, or our patients are that, I could have retired a long time ago. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop ways in which we can showcase whether that is a potential issue or not. So one thing we've got over in the ED flow measures is an average acuity score. Now, this is a very, very new trial metric. What it's designed to do is it's designed to look at the HRG of patients within the emergency department and apply a score rating dependent upon the tariff for that HRG. So I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's still very much in trial. But we've got the average acuity in there. We've got things such as population data as well. And once again, these are not things that we've created in isolation. We have worked with organisations who have said, well, what we would like to know, Chris, is do we see more patients who suffer from a mental health um, uh, condition attending our A&E departments? Or do we have more high impact users? So we've tried to create this dashboard that will answer all of those questions automatically for people. So we've got demand data, we've got some ambulance data, we've got ED flow measures, population, but then also, but I've not put on here, we've also got things like uh, the criteria to reside, patients will go on different particular pathways and things like long stay patients and bed occupancy, because we know that they're always going to be hot topics of conversation. Another way to have a look at this, and this once again comes from the ESIS UEC dashboard, is that we're great in the NHS at looking at one metric in isolation. I'm really sorry, I've just noticed that my camera's off. I'll put that back on now. The, the metric comparison graph. Now, what this allows us to do is it allows us to have a look at more than one metric and the relationship slash correlation between those metrics. So we're great at just having a look at, well, what's happening in terms of four hour performance, what's happening in terms of elective recovery, what's happening in terms of attendances or demand or something like that. But what we really want to understand is how does that change over time? And does one a decline in one mean an increase in another? And the, the, the four metrics I always like to have on here as kind of a, a measure of flow is the demand coming through the front door, which is our red line. We've then got our long stay patients, and that's the, the amount of um, beds occupied by patients with a length of stay of 21 days or more. We've got the blue line, which is the time to treatment, which is the percentage of patients treated within the first 60 minutes. And then we've got the light green line, which is the four hours. What this graph enables you to do is it enables you to paint a picture or tell a story that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do if you just looked at one metric. Because what we can see is that over the past three months, the red line, which is our demand, and our long stay patients have been increasing. So we've got increasing pressure on the front door of our urgent emergency care from an acute perspective. We've also got an increase in the demand from our acute wards perspective. So we've got a, a, an increase in our demand, which is a restriction in flow in terms of ED. We've also got an increase in long stay patients, which is a restriction in flow for our acute wards. And that meant that we have had a complete nose to tail acute restriction in flow, which we can see because of the deterioration in the percentage of patients treated within the first 60 minutes and the percentage of patients that have been admitted, treated or discharged within the four hours. So once again, it just moves us away from looking at one metric in isolation and being able to tell a story through one graph and visualising it in a much easier way. So let's just have a look at what we looked at today. We've looked at data for improvement. We've looked at understanding what it takes to actually define a measure, actually look at the data, working with our analysts. We've looked at the role of an analyst and you know, movement away from what would 
be considered to be a traditionalist of just sitting behind their computer screen and you know not really getting out and about. Paul's then talked about what is SPC and hopefully you've got a better a bit of a better understanding around what statistical process control is. And then it's also about where do we go from here? So if you don't know your informatics people, please, I really do encourage you to go out and try and find out who they are and where they live and what they do. Well, not necessarily where they live, taken out of context, where where they sit within the office. Um, I mean, you go and find out where they live if they want. I probably wouldn't encourage that. But it's more about the what are we going to do with it? So we've got all of this data now. We've got a dashboard that tells us all the things that we want to know but what is the our improvement journey and what are we going to do with the data and the evidence what once we've got it so that's the end of our our series today and um, once again my uh, uh mine and paul's emails are on there please also feel free to uh, to harass um and uh, and heckle us on twitter as well both our uh, our handles are on that uh, i'm happy to take any questions or comments if people have got any As anyone, uh, Linda. Hi, Chris, Paul. Thank you for that. Really interesting. A lot of it is a refresher in some ways, but there's, there's you know, it's really helpful to have that all in one place and hear it from you both. Um, my, it's a comment really. I think some of the tools that you've talked about today um, are, are going to be really helpful. I'm just not sure how wide they're spread. I've not seen them before. Um, and I think it'd be really good if, if if we could have access to those. And my other point is, um, again, we're just starting to have a little bit of a different model in terms of how we deliver our QI service across our trust and that we're looking to be more coaches, mentors, support so that the accountability and the delivery for the QI uh, change sits more with the operational and clinical leads and that's very much the message that you were sort of advocating today in terms of that partnership where we've got the theory and we've got the sort of specialist knowledge but they've got the where for all and the and the capability capacity to do the change so I, I like that uh, how that um, sort of overlaps as well just wanted to just to share that but I'm just thinking if we could then start um, equipping some of these teams who are going to be doing the delivery going forward with a similar presentation. I'm just wondering if there's something about train the trainer within organisations yeah. so yeah. they could carry on doing what you've done more locally. Yeah, I think I think those two points are really, really great, Linda. So so on, on your first point around the dissemination of the dashboard. Yeah, um, it's been it's been a challenge. So the dashboard is actually or the UEC one that Paul predominantly talked about was uh, has been in uh, in existence for around about five years. That's pretty much been word of mouth. How that has got to how that's got to well, you know, around about three thousand people is word of mouth. I suppose the problem is the word of mouth will only go so far, mm -hmm. um, and and how you do that. To be honest with you, I I don't really know what the solution is around that apart from presenting and having series like this where we talk about it with more people and we can put it on Twitter and other social media platforms if but you again, want. Again, it's only so far you two can spread if this, you know, such of a, course. a small team. Yeah. Uh, but uh, interest, I've just been asked this week to uh, create a, da a similar dashboard and we'd mm -hmm. be reinventing the wheel looking yeah. at what you've got and I wasn't aware of that. So that that's great linda we we will be in contact with you for sure um around about the, um sending out these dashboards for you they they are available at so i should stress they they are available at regional um ics trust and site position so which whichever type of organization you work for they are available at that uh, pick it up on your second point so um I always always jest and say when i had a proper job uh, when i worked at a trust and um was some of my most valuable time was not spent behind a computer screen. It was actually going out and spending time, whether that was with operational people or clinical people, to understand, you know, I always remember the times I spent with uh, my stroke, uh, stroke colleagues. And, you know, when they were saying about a TIA, I was like going, right, OK, so now a trans ischemic attack and I can still mm -hmm. tell you the ICD-10 code for, an, for a <laughs> TIA and whether it's high risk or low risk. And those sort of things stick with you. But, but then when when the consultant said to me, we need to do some work around stroke care, I was like, 
great. I know exactly what you mean. I know the difference mm. between a CT and an MR. I know, you know, I know all these things. If you just sat behind a computer screen, you would okay. never, ever, ever pick that up. Yeah, so I'm a you. huge advocate of spending time outside. I mean, obviously, it's been a challenge over the past mm. couple of years, and hopefully that's getting a little bit better. But that's how you build up that, that experience and how you join up those three different groups of people. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. Really enjoyed it. No problem. Thanks, Linda. Are there any other hands up or questions? I know there was one about the um, uh, the slides, but they will de definitely be coming out to people. OK, well, we haven't got any more hands up, Paul. Are there any questions in the chat box? Yeah, I'm just sorry. Uh, my Teams is playing up, but I'm just having a quick look through the um, through the chat box. Uh, it looks like there is one from uh, Rosalind, for the COVID data on the last slide, what would be a better way? Um, so from my perspective, and Chris, feel free to jump in here, just a simple line chart would be the way to show that. That the What we were trying to demonstrate with that is that you can overcomplicate things with an SPC chart. Um, and when you've got an SPC chart where every data point is special cause variation, it loses any sort of value and you'll lose any kind of, um, you know, any authenticity or you know or any kind of uh expertise in trying to present that to someone so just putting that as a line chart is is enough um we we kind of see that sbc is, is is you know is really taking off as a a way of, of demonstrating improvement um but it's not the be all and end all as well um it's really good at appropriate times but other times sometimes you just need to just graph it out um or put it into a table if, if that's the kind of the 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 way inclined that the the user is um but just a simple line graph would have been enough to demonstrate okay we've got this huge kind of increase in our occupied covid beds um and that's that kind of that that simple as simple as it needs to be without being simpler um just graphing that out would have been enough i think unless chris you've got an, a different opinion so uh, look right as i said right at the beginning getting back to basics and keeping things simple you know we are great in the nhs at over complicating things um and you know the, sometimes i see things and it, it's overly complicated for entirely the wrong reasons if something is complicated to understand you need some complicated stuff that that's absolutely fine i have not got a problem with that but sometimes the simpler the better because more people will understand it the more simpler and the basic you get i'm not saying that everyone's simple i'm really really not saying that please do not misinterpret what I'm trying to talk about but keeping it to high level basic numbers that people understand the message is the best way to get mass engagement with people there will be people that kind of go yeah but could we do blah 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 whatever and that's absolutely fine but if you are doing a pitch to a big pe a big group of people trying to keep it at a very very simple to understand level is definitely the best approach for it and let's be honest, you know, we all saw those, you know, the the, the presentations from uh, from uh, Professor Chris Whitty um, and, uh, you know, they, they didn't have it. They literally had just, you know, very, very simple line graphs. And I'm really glad that Paul uh, took over control. So he didn't have to say next slide, please. Uh, which is a bit of a bugbear in mind, but there we go. There's one uh, one other comment here from from Sue. Um, SBC is fab for reviewing data retrospectively, but what we are encouraging our teams to do is understand what is happening in the here and now and whether a process or system is running to plan or not. Am I right in thinking that SBC doesn't really help in that environment? So no, that's exactly what an SBC is, mm. is really good for. Um, yep. Depending on kind of the refresh rate of the data. So if it's, you know, if you're looking at it kind of hourly, which would be quite extreme, I guess, but if you're looking at it daily and as you just add those points on, the rules will get updated and you can kind of you can track that as you go along. So actually SBC is really good for doing that kind of near live investigation of whether or not something's happening. Now, obviously, it's not going to be kind of telling you, you know, tonight we it's going to be this or, or you know, tomorrow morning it's going to be that. But changed, you know, it doesn't necessarily move that fast anyway. So it's it is really good if you keep it kind of that constantly updating. It is actually a really good way of showing if the here and now is, is happening as you expect or not. So, and, and for 
you know, I've seen um, kind of alert tools or things like that that have been used and they use SPC to kind of say whether this is out of the ordinary to have, I don't know, 95 patients in the department at half past one on a Thursday afternoon. That is what SPC can be used for because it will alert you to things. So, yeah, Sue, uh, happy to pick that up uh, offline with you um, anytime. OK, I think that's it from everybody. So once again, thank you so much for your time uh, this afternoon. I hope you've got something out of that. Um, there is also an evaluation form that Crystal has just put onto the chat box. It would be fantastic if you could um, fill that out. It'll only take you 30 seconds of your time, just so that we can try and understand whether we've pitched this right or if we want to do one in the in the future as well. And on the slide deck, it will have both of uh, Paul and myself's email. We will be more than happy to have separate sessions or just have a QA and a or a chat or whatever um, uh, with you at any point in the future. So thanks very much uh, from Paul and myself, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.